Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you what is the new standardized way of returning problems through HTTP API responses and I'm going to show you how to implement it in .NET and this is what you would use if you return a validation error for example and things like that. Now this is implementing the RFC 9457 if I'm not wrong which is a standardized way an RFC agreed standard on how we should do this. We can actually see it over here. It came out a year ago in July 2023 and it defines how this should all look. It obsoletes the previous 7807 and is primarily on carrying machine readable details of errors in HTTP API responses. And because APIs are primarily read by machines, this just standardized the way to do this. So let me just show you what I have here. I have a weather API, but it's using a real weather API behind the scenes. So if I go here, what you'll see is I'm calling the open weather map API and I'm passing down the city and the units, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and so on. And then I'm getting the weather for a city. So if I run this API and I go to Insomnia and I say, give me the weather for London in Celsius, then I'm gonna send this request. And as you can see, I'm getting the current weather now for London. If I say, give this to me for Fahrenheit, I'm gonna get Fahrenheit. If I say give this to me for Kelvin, I'm going to get Kelvin. And I can change the cities to Paris, to Warsaw, to whatever I want. So this is using the current real weather. Now, the problem arises when I have an input on the unit that is not a standardized one. So if I have Celsius or Fahrenheit on Kelvin, and to be honest, this shouldn't really be here. This should kind of be in the get weather for city async method, but I want to simplify how the demo is going. So that's why I'm going to keep it here, but you wouldn't do this here. You would do it in here instead. And the problem is, how, what do you return here, right? Well, probably you would return something like this. You would say return results, and then you would say bad request, and you would have an object specific to your bad request. And you might say, for example, error is invalid units and potentially message equals whatever you can only use kelvin celsius or fahrenheit and then what would happen if you went and you called the api with invalid units you would get a 400 bad request with invalid units and you can do that and you can have your standardized way of doing it but now we have the standard proper way of doing this and we actually for a while now had the problem or validation problem which is more specific to validation on returning what happened. So we're gonna see how we can use that. And not only that, we're gonna see how we can use an exception handler as well to make this more global. So we don't have to have it here if we don't want to. So the first thing we can do is we can just define all the properties here. So we can say type bad request, then we can say title invalid units, then we can say details, units can only be C for Celsius or F for Fahrenheit, or if we include uh, Kelvin as well, we can say C, um, F or Okay, you can customize that to whatever you want. And then we can also say that status code should be status codes dot 400 bad request. The moment we do that and we run the API, I can go back and call this bad endpoint and I can call this API and I'm getting my response back, right? So this is the simplest way you can use this new RFC. But this is a bare minimum and we actually want to go a bit further and we want to implement this more on a global scale and in different ways and we can extend it actually. The first thing is that if you see we have very minimal details here and if we want to debug and know exactly what's going on we don't really have much information about the request itself. So we can add that by going up here and saying builder.service.add problem details and we can customize the options. So a few things I would want to see, for example, is request ID and trace ID. And I'm also gonna add instance. Those are all part of the standard response. So what I wanna say here is options.customize on problem details and then get the problem details context. And in here, I'm gonna say context.problemdetails.instance equals, and I'm gonna use this concatenated string with the request method, so get, post, or whatever, and then the path to know which request cause that obviously you know it because you're copying it but if someone copies the response or dumps it somewhere uh, maybe in a log message it just makes it easier to know exactly what happened then we can say the same thing context.problemdetails.extensions and we can try to add the request id here as well so i'm going to say request id and then i'm going to say context.http context.trace identifier so just a string identifying 
um, the request, the ID of the request. The last thing I want to do is get the activity by doing context.http context features get, get the IHTP activity feature, and then say context.problemdetails.extensions and say try add the trace ID as well. So what we want to say is activity.id. Here we go. And if this is null, add nothing. And by just doing that without actually changing anything in our code down here, for all of our requests now that are returned as a problem, if I call this, I'm going to also get the instance, the request ID, and the trace ID. Extremely, extremely useful. And you can just say, here's this trace ID or here's this request ID. Go and correlate and tell me exactly what happened. So now that I have that, my API uses this new standard and everything is nice and clean. But we might not want to do this here, especially if we have a standardized way for returning these sorts of problems or validation exceptions or whatever it is. I'm not necessarily a fan of this approach. I'm going to show you now, but I know tons of people use it and different architectures recommend it. So I have to show it. What I'm going to do is go here and create a new class and call it problem exception handler. So I'm going to stop this API. And in here, I'm also going to create a model to represent this problem. So what I will have is a problem exception, extending the normal exception. We can actually also say serializable here. And then we have an error, we have a message, and we pass the message here and the error we store. And then now we have the handler. And what I want to add in the handler is the following. I'm going to inject because I added this add problem details thing, which now registers a service for me. And that service is private read only I problem details service. So I'm going to inject this one in here and I'm going to implement the I exception handler interface, which gives me this value task Boolean method called handle async with a context exception and a cancellation token. So this will allow me to have global error handling if I want to. And to register all this, all you need to do is go to the program.cs and say builder.services.add exception handler. And I'm going to use the problem exception handler over here. And I'm also going to have to register the middleware above everything else. So app.use exception handler. So now it is registered, but I need to implement it. So what do I want to say here? Well, I only want to care about this type of exception for now, but if you have a validation exception or any other exception, you can implement it here. So what I'm going to say is if exception is not the problem exception, I'm going to say problem exception, then just return true. And well, I can actually change this to async because I'm going to have some awaiting going on here. So if not, return true. Otherwise, I want to define a problem details object, which is a new problem details. Here we go. And this is an ASP.NET core class. And I'm going to have the same things as before. So the status, status codes, and that is a 400 because that's how we represent validation problems. Then the title, which I'm going to get from the problem details that I extracted from over here, the problem exception. So error goes here, then I have the details, which is problem exception dot message. And then I'm going to say type is bad request. Here we go. So now I have my problem details. And how do I write them? Well, all I say is return await problem detail service, try write async new problem details context. And we're going to write the HTTP context over here. So HTTP context. And then we are also going to write the problem details. So you can have additional metadata as well but I'm just going to write that. So just by adding that now, if I go back to my program.cs and I remove this, I'm just going to comment this one out because you want to grab the code from the description down below to just play around with it. I'm going to say throw new problem exception, and I'm going to put down the error, which is invalid units. Here we go. And then I'm going to add the message. And if I just go now and I run this API, watch what happens. My API is running. If I have a valid set of units, this all works fine, Celsius, Fahrenheit. But if I say A, which doesn't exist, then I have the exact same experience, bad request, invalid units, status 400. But this is units can only be C, F, or K. Now we have a bit of a problem. This is a 500 now, not a 400. So I'm going to have to write the appropriate status code as well. Do this. All you have to say is HTTP context over here and then response and then status code equals 400 or I'm just going to grab it from here and then paste it. If I just hot reload and I go and I run my endpoint again, now I'm getting a 400. So you have full access to the response here. You can do whatever you want. Otherwise, 
everything just goes and flows naturally. Now, whichever approach you want to follow, it's completely up to you. I'm more of a camp of the on the first approach, and I would actually use functional programming and monads as well for this. But whichever one you choose, completely up to you. Both of them work. And the global exception handler is a great feature in general. And the problem details, you can inject them to anywhere to just write those responses if you need them. And anything you add in that problem details thing over here will work. Now, before I wrap it up, I'd like to let you know that we just released 23 brand new courses on design patterns in .NET. We're covering basically every design pattern. The first 100 of you can use discount code patterns20 at checkout to get an additional 20% to the existing 20% because bundles are always discounted on Dome Train. So check the link in the description down below. And now I know from you, did you know about this? And what approach would you follow to do something like this? Leave a comment down below. Let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.